1536, France gives a temporary amnesty to all these guys who ran away. Calvin goes back for a few months to settle his accounts, get his brother Anton and Marie, and he leaves forever, never to return. But something awesome happens. You all know this story, but oh, is it important. Historically, it's so important. He says, I'm off to Strasbourg. I know what I'm wired to do. I'm going to go there and be safe, secure, comfortable and easy and write books to defend the gospel till I die someday in ease in Strasbourg. Well, there happens to be a war going on between uh, Charles V and Francis I, and the troops are moving on the road between Paris and Strasbourg, and so he takes a, door, a detour through Geneva. <laughs> detour, ha, huh? he says. It's exactly the same as, and behold, Caesar Augustus declared... A tax. Why? Well, just to get a virgin from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's why. That, that's why these, that's why these, uh, troops were in the way to get Calvin to Geneva. Don't doubt that one minute. Of course, there are 10,000 other things God was doing. Just like, you know why you came to this conference? Or why we, why we held this conference? So that a maid over the Holiday Inn would be saved. That's why. So that a van driver would hear the gospel. That's why. And 10,000 other reasons nobody ever thought of. We're here that God's doing. Okay. He goes to Geneva. One night, William Farrell, firebrand of the Reformation in Geneva, finds out that he's there. And he comes to him, and this is what happened. Let's let Calvin give us the words this time. Pharaoh, who burned with an extraordinary zeal to advance the gospel, immediately learned that my heart was set on devoting myself to private studies, for which I wished to, to keep myself free from all other pursuits. And finding that he, he gained nothing by entreaties, he proceeded to utter an imprecation that God would curse my retirement and the tranquility of my studies, which I sought if I should withdraw and refuse to give assistance in Geneva when the necessity was so urgent. By this imprecation, I was so stricken with terror that I desisted from my journey, which I had taken. So I told you he believed in submission. This happened again later on. So the course of his life is forever turned by this providence of going through Geneva and 48 volumes later of books and tracts and sermons and commentaries and letters. We thank God for this providence. He took up his responsibilities as professor of sacred scriptures first. In Geneva, in 1536, and then in four months, he became the pastor, one of the pastors of St. Peter's or St. Pierre's, however you want to say it, in uh, Geneva. It was one of three parishes. There were 10,000 people in the city, so you can see how roughly it was divided up. 3,000 people or so he'd be responsible for with the other pastors there. And then, lo and behold, because he and Farrell are such hotheads and firebrands and believe in the gospel and the church and the city council isn't that far along, he and Farrell get banished out of the city. April 1538, and he is relieved. Oh, whew, done with that city, because it was nothing but trouble anyway. Wanted to die a thousand deaths, he said. Remember, I told you last night at the banquet how he wanted to die every day. And so he's glad now. He's off to Strasbourg, and lo and behold, Martin Busser, who's ministering to the poor French refugees in, uh, where is he? Strasbourg, yeah, he, Calvin went to Basel. Now, he, Stra, Booster comes to get him. And here's what Calvin wrote. That most excellent servant of Christ, Martin Booster, employing a similar kind of remonstrance to Farrell and protestation as that which Farrell had recourse to before drew me back, uh, drew me to the new station. Alarmed by the example of Jonah, which he set before me, I still continued in the work of teaching. Meaning, 
I went with him and became professor of New Testament there and became the pastor of 500 French refugees for the next three years of his life. Now, probably the most important thing about those three years in Strasbourg before he goes back to Geneva is, is maybe the Romans commentary, maybe the second edition of the Institutes, but it's probably Idolette, his wife. She was a, an Anabaptist, believe it or not. He had no truck for the Anabaptists at all, and she married one, and her husband, Jean, uh, died, and uh, he married her in August 6th of 1540. And she had two children, and the daughter came along uh, with them back to uh, Geneva and eventually broke Calvin's heart because she got involved in an affair. And uh, they were married then for nine years. More about that in, in just a minute. May 1st, 1541, the city council changes its mind. We've really blown it because we sent away John Calvin, William Farrell. Let's get him back. And so he agonizes through this decision again, and he goes back and stays there for the rest of his life, which is not very long, 23 more years, and he dies when he's 54 years old. You keep your bow strung like he did, and you won't live beyond 54, probably. Tuesday, September 13, 1541, he entered Geneva for the second time to serve that church until he died. His first son is born July 28, 42. He dies in two weeks. And two other children die in childbirth. And then she never recovers. And nine years later, I'd let Calvin dies and he never remarries. So there's this season of great heartache in his life. All of his children die. His wife dies. He never remarries. He writes to Vere, um, You know well how tender or rather soft my mind is. Had not a powerful self-control been given to me. <laughs> That's an understatement. Had not a powerful self-control been given to me, I could not have borne up so long. Truly mine is no common source of grief. I have been bereaved of the best companion of my life, of one who, had it been so ordained, would have willingly shared not only my poverty, but even my death. During her life, she was the faithful helper of my ministry. From her, I never experienced the slightest hindrance. She was never troublesome to me throughout the whole course of her illness, but was more anxious about her children than herself. As I feared these private worries might upset her to no purpose, I took occasion three days before she died to mention that I would not fail in discharging my duty towards her children. He never remarried, and oh, it is good that he did not, because the life he then led would have been a disappointment to any woman. Listen to this summary of it uh, from Colladon, who was a contemporary Calvin, for... Uh, did not um, spare himself at all, he wrote, working far beyond what his power and regard for his health could stand. He preached commonly every day for one week in two and twice every Sunday or a total of ten times every fortnight. Every week he lectured three times in theology. He was at the consistory on the appointed day and made all the remonstrances. Every Friday at the Bible study, what he added after the leader had made his declaration was almost a lecture. He never failed in visiting the sick, in private warning and counsel, and the rest of the numberless matters arising out of the ordinary exercise of his ministry. But besides these ordinary tasks, he had great care for believers in France, both in teaching them and exhorting and counseling them and consoling them by letters when they were being persecuted and also in interceding for them. Yet all that did not prevent him from going on working at his special study and composing many splendid and useful books. Wolfgang Musculus called him a bow always strung to his great destruction. Caledon said, for many years, with a single meal a day, he never took anything between two meals. His reason was that the weakness of his stomach and his migraine headaches could only be controlled, he found out, by experiment through continual 
abstinence. But on the other hand, he was apparently very careless of his health, working night and day, scarcely without a break, scarcely without sleep. And to show how driven the man was, he wrote to Fallet in 1546, apart from the sermons and the lectures, now, let me read it all. Apart from the sermons and the lectures, there is a month gone by in which I have scarce done anything. In such wise, I am almost ashamed to live this useless life. Now, he's talking 20 sermons and 12 lectures in that month. To get a clear picture of his ironed constancy through it all, on behalf of the majesty of God, we need to hear about his sicknesses just a little bit, just briefly here. He wrote to his physicians when he was 53 years old. I'm 51, so I can resonate what that age would be like. And described his colic, his spitting of blood, his ague, his gout in the feet, his excruciating suffering from hemorrhoids, and worst of all, he says, the kidney stones. Quote, they gave me such exquisite pain. At length, not without the most painful strainings, I ejected a calculus, which in some degree mitigated my sufferings, but such was the size of it that it lacerated the urinary canal and a copious Discharge of blood followed. The hemorrhage could only be arrested by an injection of milk through a syringe. You know, you, I have a separate paper here that I, 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 I wrote on along the way called The Barbarity of the Age of John Calvin because I thought I was going to talk about Michael Servetus and you're all waiting for me to get there and I'm not going to say a word about it until you ask me about it in the question and answer time. But the barbarity of this age... You got to feel from quotes like that. We can come back to that later. Not only the physical sufferings, but the, the threats to his life were just unbelievable. Just imagine Francis I and King Charles, and they're in Winona, Minnesota, say 50 miles away or so, and within a half an hour, they can be here. And this is what he wrote to Melanchthon. Whence you may conclude, he said, that we have not only exile to fear, but all the most cruel varieties of death are impending over us. For in the cause of religion, they will set no bounds to their barbarity. That's why Saul wanted his armor bearer to kill him. Calvin knew what would come if the army did what it could do, and he ministered under that kind of pressure. Not only that, he was surrounded by enemies. They shot muskets over his house at night. The, the mobs would shout out, you come out of there, we're throwing you in the river tomorrow morning on your way to the Lord's house. The libertines were his biggest ache, probably. They were the contemporary Corinthians who boasted in their immorality. In every city in Europe in those days, Men had mistresses. It was regulated. In Geneva, you could only have one mistress. And that's the town that he came to. And years after he had been preaching there, these libertines had now gotten into the church and discovered some neat Pauline ways to justify the communion of saints, which meant wife sharing for the libertines in his church. And so they caused endless grief for him, and not just in the way you might think, but in very severe, life-threatening ways. Let me tell you one little story here to show you the commitment to the majesty of Christ and the crisis that he faced week after week in this city. The city council, in Calvin's view, had no jurisdiction over excommunication. Calvin was the great deliverer of the church from state control, believe it or not. The consistory of elders and pastors excommunicated. Well, the crisis came when this Bertollier fellow, who was a libertine, was excommunicated for his sexual immorality by the consistory of the church of St. Peter's, and he appeals his case to the city council, and they overturn it and say he can go to communion. Calvin says, he writes a letter to Viret, I took an oath 
that I had resolved rather to meet death than profane so shamefully the Holy Supper of the Lord. My ministry is abandoned if I suffer the authority of the consistory to be trampled upon and extend the supper of Christ to open scoffers. I should rather die a hundred times than subject Christ to such foul mockery. So here comes the Sunday morning. And Bertolier not only has himself, but many libertines with him in the congregation. And Calvin knows they're there, and he knows the city council is watching, and the whole Genevan Reformation probably is at stake in 1553. So here's the report taken from Beza, who wrote the first biography, quoted in, I forget what book I got it from. The, the sermon had been preached. The prayers had been offered. And Calvin descended from the pulpit to take his place beside the elements at the communion table. The bread and wine were duly consecrated by him. And he was not ready to distribute, he was now ready to distribute them to the communicants. Then, on a sudden, a rush was begun by the troublers in Israel in the direction of the communion table. Calvin flung his arms around the sacramental vessels as if to protect them from sacrilege while he, while his voice rang out through the building, these hands you may crush, these arms you may lop off, my life you may take, my blood is yours, you may shed it, but you shall never force me to give holy things to the profane and dishonor the table of my God. And after this, says Biza, the sacred ordinance was celebrated with a profound silence. <laughs> and under solemn awe, all present felt as if the deity himself had been visible among them. Now, the point of that and all of this talk about his sufferings physically, his threats politically, is simply to illustrate his unwavering allegiance to the majesty of Christ in the word, in the table, against all odds. And I believe that the experience that he had with God's majesty in the scriptures yielded this constancy. There had been a supernatural inward testimony to the majesty of God in scripture. He could not escape it. And this word was therefore God's word. And now he would live for this God and this word all his life, no matter what. Now, to ex let me see how much time I should take here and decide what to do here. I'll try to wrap it up in, in a few more minutes. His view of Scripture, which defined the remainder of his ministry, was very high. He said, we owe to the Scripture the same reverence which we owe to God because it proceeded from him alone and has nothing of man mixed with it. His own experience had taught him Quote, the highest proof of the scripture derives in general from the fact that God in person speaks in it. Those were the incontrovertible truths for John Calvin. The scriptures were the voice of God. God vindicates God by bringing us to life by his majestic witness. We see him in his scriptures and he and they then become authoritative immediately for our lives. And what kind of life is born for Calvin? It was a life of invincible constancy in the exposition of Scripture. Tracts, institutes, commentaries. Commentaries on every New Testament book except Revelation. Numerous Old Testament books. But all of it, all of it, including these two books here, is exposition of Scripture. Dylan Berger says, Calvin assumed that his whole theological labor was the exposition of Scripture. He wrote at the end of his life, I have endeavored both in my sermons 
and also in my writings and commentaries to preach the word purely and chastely and faithfully to interpret his sacred scriptures. Everything was exposition of scripture. That was the kind of ministry that was unleashed by his experience. And preaching then became the main vehicle. Emile, I'm not sure how to pronounce his French name, Dumerju or Dumerg or whatever Americans would say if he read it. He's the main biographer, six volumes, on the 400th anniversary of John Calvin, standing in his own pulpit in Geneva, wrote, That is the Calvin who seems to me to be the real and authentic Calvin, the one who explains all others Calvin, the preacher of Geneva, molding by his words the spirit of the reformed of the 16th century. Calvin's preaching was of one kind, and it never, ever changed. It was sequential, expository preaching through book after book after book. On Sunday morning, he always took New Testament, afternoon, New Testament, sometimes a psalm on Sunday, during the week, three times, always Old Testament. There are only fewer than half a dozen instances where he broke pattern for any church year event. So, Don Whitney, if you wonder what to do on Christmas, preach on Deuteronomy 29-23. Or whatever happens to be next. That's what Calvin did. Every Easter, every Christmas, he plowed right on through with fewer than half a dozen exceptions. Now, to give you an idea, picture this. It's August 25th, 1549, and he begins a series of messages on the book of Acts. We know this because that was the first time when he had a stenographer who was taking down his sermons. He preached totally without notes and without anything straight from the Greek and straight from the Hebrew right there in front of him. He begins Acts on August 25th, 1549. He ends Acts on Sunday morning in March 1554. So it was from 49 to 54, he's preaching on Acts. Straight through. And then, after that, he picks up Thessalonians, 46 sermons. Corinthians, 186 sermons. Pastorals, 86 sermons. Galatians, 43 sermons. Ephesians, 48 sermons. Until May of 1558, when he has to quit for half a year because he's sick. As you can well imagine, he might be with the relentless schedule that he's kept. He begins then in 1559, the harmony of the Gospels, and he dies while he's doing it in 1564. Now, during that time, during the week, he's preaching 159 sermons on Job, 200 on Deuteronomy, 353 on Isaiah, 123 on Genesis, and so on. The numbers are phenomenal. The point is, this is no accident. He chose to do this. Here's the story that I love that shows how completely self-conscious he is in this. On... Um, Easter Day, 1538, he's banished out of Geneva that first time, remember? He's been preaching for about a year. He's banished for three years to minister in Strasbourg. They call him back. He comes back in September 1541 and walks into the pulpit and picks up at the next verse. <laughs> And he, he comments on the fact that he wanted them to know that it was just an interlude in his exposition <laughs> of the Word of God. Why? I'm closing now with these last three answers, very short answers to the question. Why that kind of preaching? Luther didn't do that. Luther preached the gospel and the epistle. Spurgeon didn't do that. Shame on Spurgeon, maybe or maybe not. Why did he do it this way? Three possible reasons. Number one, Calvin believed 
the lamp of the word had gone out in Europe. The word had been taken away. Here's what he said. He's confessing his own sin to the Lord. He says, thy word, which ought to have shone on all thy people like a lamp, was taken away or at least suppressed as to us. And now, O oh Lord, what remains to a wretch like me but earnestly to supplicate thee not to judge according to my deserts that fearful abandonment of thy word from which in thy wondrous goodness thou hast delivered me. So you feel in his conversion the, the horror he felt. He saw by the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit the majesty of God revealed in the Word and he looked across the church and he said, what a fearful abandonment of the holy, precious Word. And his whole life then became, I am going to lay this Word out every day for the rest of my life. It is so precious. That's reason number one. Number two... Um, T.H.L. Parker says Calvin had a horror of those who preach their own ideas in the pulpit. Oh, we need that horror today. He says, when, Calvin says, when we enter the pulpit, it is not so that we may bring our own dreams and fancies with us. So evidently he believed that the best safeguard against bringing my fancies into the pulpit is to systematically work my way through God's ordered, inspired, majesty-revealing word. Finally, the third reason brings us full circle back to the majesty of God in the word. He really believed that when the word was faithfully exposited, God, in His majesty, stood forth in the congregation. Listen to this great exhortation to you from Calvin. Let the pastors boldly dare all things by the word of God. Let them constrain all the power, glory, excellence of the word to give place to and to obey the divine majesty of this word. Let them enjoin everyone by it from the highest to the lowest. Let them edify the body of Christ. Let them devastate Satan's reign. Let them pasture the sheep, kill the wolves, instruct, exhort the rebellious. Let them bind and loose thunder and lightning if necessary. But let them do all according to the word of God. In other words, the key phrase there is the divine majesty of his word. Calvin believed that if his goal in life was to illustrate the glory of God, and if the glory of God is uniquely and self-authenticatingly revealed in the word of God, then the full display of the word would be the fullest display of the glory. I think that's the way he reasoned. And my own personal conviction when I ask myself the question, can it be done any other way besides preaching? How about just teaching with an overhead? How about small group discussions? How about lectures? How about books? How about computer CDs sent to China? What's to become of preaching? And this is my conviction. I don't know what Calvin would say. But I'm a preacher and I have to believe in what I'm doing. And so I want to know why I am so drawn to do it. And I believe the answer is nothing will ever replace preaching. And the reason I believe that preaching uniquely, not teaching per se, not reading the Bible per se, but preaching to the congregation over a text will always be there is because God means for himself in the fullness of his glory to be extolled and glorified and honored and cherished. And something about that event of worship beckons for more than analysis. It beckons for more than explanation. It beckons for expository exaltation. 
That's what I like to call it. Preaching is the worshipful moment over the Word. It is expository exaltation. And wherever God-centeredness is alive... Wherever the supremacy of God reigns in the hearts of a people, something inside will say, Oh, pastor, do more for us than explain it to us. Love it over us. Cherish it over us. Taste it over us. Revel in it over us. Exult in it over us. Because we need to see it come alive and burn in you. And that is what is called preaching. Father, I thank you so much for the help that John Calvin has been to me and for many. We make no claim of his perfection, and I surely make no claims of infallibility in this message and ask that you would balance it now with all that you need to be for these brothers here in their preaching. Balance it out with all that I haven't said that needs to be said. And make us faithful to this glorious word and to your majesty in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message by John Piper, pastor for preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message to give to others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit Desiring God online at www.desiringgod.org. There you'll find hundreds of sermons, articles, radio broadcasts, and much more, all available to you at no charge. Our online store carries all of Pastor John's books, audio, and video resources. You can also stay up to date on what's new at Desiring God. Again, our website is www. Dot desiringgod.org or call us toll free at 1-888-346-4700 our mailing address is desiring god 2601 east franklin avenue minneapolis minnesota 55406 desiring god exists to help you make god your treasure because god is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.